All right, let's get started. So today we're going to finish type one and go into type two turbine. Okay. So if you recall from last time where we ended up basically as type three turbine, if you look at the circuit, this is a simple circuit or relatively simple circuit. So you have some grid voltage, VA1 here. So this is our uh, circuit for the type one turbine. Okay. And uh, this is a really easy circuit to work with, to analyze. But uh, there are some drawbacks, and uh, we saw some of those drawbacks last time. Right? We said this is basically it has a very narrow operating range. Okay? So the operating range is quite narrow. Right? You can only operate. So if you look at the torque speed relationship, this is the speed. This is torque or the power. We have something like this. And your operating range is quite narrow. Right? You can only operate in this sort of narrow band. Right? So that's one drawback of the type one turbine. The second drawback is we'll always have this inductors in the turbine, right? So this inductor, this will consume reactive power. Okay, this will consume reactive power. And there were some questions, you know, from the homework is, why do we have inductors here? And the why has these come from the way we wire the system, right? You cannot get rid of this inductor, okay? So inductors often, there's two places where inductors show up. One place where inductors show up is this RLC filter circuits. For example, in power electronics, where you, where you want to filter a signal, right? Where you want to filter some waveform, right? So those filter circuits, the inductors are, are, are there by design. Whereas in this type type one turbines, they're there because the, that's a na the nature of how the wires work. Okay, so we have stator and rotors, we have windings on them, they look like inductors. Okay, so whether we want them to be there or not, these inductors are inherently in the system. Okay, so that's why they have to consume reactive power. Okay, so it's not that we want the inductors to be there, it just, you can't get rid of them in this type one turbine. Okay, so, oh, right, so the consumer reactive power, also we need to care, we worry about stability. Okay, so the two, three, these are the two major drawbacks of the turbine, right? And stability basically comes from the following fact, right? So you look at stability, let's think about stability. Okay, so I think of stability. As the, let's say this is our turbine. Okay, so I have one, I have mechanical wind power. In one side going into the turbine, these are basically, you know, the blade turning, right? This is the turning of the blade. These are the mechanical power into the system. I have electric power. Right, so see some electric power is being drawn, right? So normally, right, so normally, or a station, a steady state, you have electric power equal to mechanical power, subtracting off any efficient, any losses. Okay, so that's a minus. So normally we'll, uh, we can, right. So let's say we have some losses. Once we, try, once we subtract that off, we have electric power equal to mechanical power. So what determines the electric power? And what determines the mechanical power in our system, right? Right, so what determines our mechanical power? Well, this is by nature. Right, this is how fast the wind is blowing. Right? There's no 
uh, we get as much mechanical power as there is in the moving what um, what determines the electric power right, so I have a turbine right so I put a you know wind turbine somewhere and uh, I'm drawing some power from it but what actually determines that power The generator. So my turbine is a generator, right? Right. So the speed of the turbine determines how much electric power I output, right? But normally in a system, there's a load and there's a generator. Okay? There's a load and the generator. Normally, when we think about the power system, the load is it is what it is. Okay. So the load will consume the power it wants to consume, and it's up to the generator to change its power setting to accommodate the load. Right, to come into the load. So for a wind turbine, for a wind turbine, does the wind turbine move to accommodate the load? Does the move to, does the wind turbine sort of changes as alpha to accommodate the grid? Right, so normally we have a generator and the load. It's a generator's job to accommodate the load. Okay, you can flip on and off your switch whenever you want. You don't have to worry about what the generator is doing. Right? It's generator job to match your load. If I have a wind turbine, is it the wind turbine's job to match the whatever condition in the grid? Or is this grid's job to match whatever condition I have in the wind turbine? Right, so whose who's job is to match who, right? So if the grid, right? So, right, so the right way to think about this, the right way to think about this is this turbine is like a negative load. Okay, the way you want to think about it is you basically have a turbine that acts like a negative load. The turbine is not going to move up and down to accommodate the grid conditions. Okay. The turbine is basically some conversion that converts the mechanical power in wind and output that as electric power. Okay. It offers as much power it wants to output. And the grid will take this power and do something with this power. Okay. So it's the grid's job to accommodate the wind turbine. Right. So wind turbine in this case acts almost like a load. It's a negative load because it's outputting power, but the turbine's job is not to change it around, to you know follow whatever the grid wants, you know, to uh, basically match the settings the grid. As the turbine will generate however much it wants to generate, based on the mechanical power it has. So this is sort of one way to think about this type one turbine. It's, it's think of as a negative load. It's basically something that just outputs the amount of power it wants to output. All right, so any question with that? Is that clear? How to think about this turbine? Okay, so think of type one turbine as a negative low in this case. Okay, it has a slip. Based on the slip, we'll generate some power and the grid's job is take this power and do something with it okay, and do something with it. All right, so that's the job of the grid. So then we can think of, right, so what if, the grid wants more power, okay? So let's say you're operating a grid and you have a turbine and the grid says, hey, you know, can you output a little bit more power to me? What, how would the turbine react? Can this type one turbine give you more power if the grid says, please give me more power? Right, so you have a turbine connected to the grid. I'm the grid operator. Now I tell the turbine, hey, you know, can you boost up your generation by let's say 10%? What would the turbine do?
How do you think about what this turbine does? Right. So let's say you work in a control center and you figure out, hey, I need more power into my system. So you call this turbine and say, you know, hey, give me 10% 10, 10 more power. What would happen? You can't change the pitch, right? The issue with this kind of thing is turbine may or may not react. Right, the reason is if you're already tracking the maximum power output of your turbine, that's normally where you set the pitch to be, right? If you set the pitch to already supply the max, track the maximum power, then if the grid wants more power, and it's too bad. Okay, so if the grid wants more power, it's too bad. Because I'm already tracking the maximum power I can have. That is determined by the wind speed. So there is a fundamental upper limit there's an upper limit how much power I can provide at any time. If, you're, if the grid wants more than that, too bad. Okay, there's, not, there's no way I can produce more power than what my maximum power is. Right? So, I can, so I can change the pitch to produce less power. Change the pitch to produce more power is probably all the question if I'm already tracking the maximum power. Okay? So if you call the turbine, then it's too bad. Right? So if the grid wants less power, then you can sort of slowly change the pitch to uh, output less power. The tricky thing, the tricky thing with this type one turbine is if there is a fault, okay, so if the grid wants more power, you always have the option to say, I, I won't give more power, right? This is sort of the maximum I can deliver. But if there is a fault, And the demand drops, right? So what we care about is actual power. Demand drops. This is a dangerous situation. Okay, this is more serious. Because you already, you have this mechanical power. Then what happens is sometimes you have a fault on your output on this sort of connection to the grid. You have a fault here. For example, you may have a short circuit fault on the grid side. Okay, then, but what happens is you can't basically dump, you know, you can't output power anymore to the grid okay, because there may be a fault. And this is more serious. Okay, so this is more, uh, I guess this is not more challenging to deal with or more difficult. Okay, so if the grid wants more power, you can say no. However, if you have this mechanical power, and for some reason you can't deliver these as electric power, then that's a more challenging situation. Okay, so in this kind of turbines, actually in many turbines, what you're afraid of is not not as what you're afraid of is having too much power. Okay, it's not that you you don't have enough, because if you don't have enough power, it's somebody else's problem to worry about. Okay, if the wind is not blowing at your turbine, then it's not your problem. However, if you have too much po mechanical power and you can't get rid of it, that's when the sort of dangerous things happen. Okay? That's when the sort of you become a more serious situation. Okay? So th that's what you're afraid of, right? So, you, so for all those turbines, a lot of times, we'll be looking at how to get rid of this power. A lot of times it's just how do I get rid of this excess power, this excess mechanical power, if I cannot dump it to the grid. If I cannot dump to the grid, how do I get rid of this power? But right? often we don't look at what happens when the grid wants more power. Right? Because often there's not something you can, that's not something you can do. Okay? The wind basically determines how much power, so the upper limit on the power you have. And uh, but for sort of dumping excess power is the engineering question for wind turbine diva. Any questions about that? Okay, so let's look at how do I dump power. Okay, so in your mind, you should think of, I'm, I'm sending power to the grid. Something happens at the grid side, and suddenly I can't output as much electric power as before. Let's look at what happens in this case. Okay, so restore balance of energy basically means how do I get rid of this excess amount of power? Okay. 
So you can always reduce mechanical power. And this is, comes from change, changing the pitch. Okay. Right, so I can change the pitch. Do you see any difficulties in changing the pitch, in changing the pitch? And there are some issues, some practical issues we may run into if say I want to suddenly change the pitch of the blade. Right, it takes time, right, in the chat. Basically, if you think back to the picture we saw of how large the blades are, these are, you know, 50, 70 meter long things. Changing the pitch of these sort of large mechanical systems takes a long time, okay? They have inertia, right? You, you cannot instantaneously change the pitch, okay? You can't get rid of. And it involves sort of gearbox, a lot of shifts. If you change pitch, you know, too quickly, the blade may be unstable because there's a sort of wobbles around. So all that, and what makes it slow. Okay. So you can change the pitch. And at the end of the day, if you manage to change the pitch, you can reduce your mechanical power. Right? You can sort of reduce how much mechanical power is going into, sorry, into the turbine. You can match the reduced electrical power, ha, electric power. However, however, this is a very slow process. Okay? For large wind turbines, right, so, you know, 100 meter, right, so blades, you know, up to 100 meters long, it just takes a long, takes a while to change the pitch. You want to do everything slowly. Okay. And so what other options do we have? So let's say you have a fault in the grid and suddenly it's like that. Okay. You have a short circuit fault. And uh, you can reduce the mechanical power, but that takes you a while, right? Let's, let's, let's say that takes you a minute to reduce your mechanical power by changing the pitch. Then what do you do in the interim? How do you respond to a very fast change in the grid side? Any ideas? So if you're designing this turbine and you're facing this issue, right? And you're facing this issue, what will you do? Can you switch the power to go somewhere else like to a battery? Uh, you can switch the power to go to, to go to a battery. That's sort of the more modern thinking, right? So the idea is correct. This is, you basically need to increase the, the electric load. Okay, however you do it, however you do it, in increase the, you need to increase the load, okay? right? So either that's a battery, right? So the suggestion is if you have a battery, connect to it you can deliver power into that battery. So if I don't have a battery, if I remember type one turbines or was around in the eighties, there's no cheap batteries at that time. Then, then what do you do? The battery of course. Resistor, maybe? Yeah, you add a resistor. So basically is, you know, you run out of ideas. This is you dump the power. You dump the power. in some external circuit, right? So basically, right? so what the idea, right? So the idea is, there's really not a storage, right? So this is, at that time, we're not really looking for storage. You're not looking to get back this power. What you look for is, I have a generator, okay? I have this sort of mechanical power or mechanical energy input, Right, so I have this normal alpha power and I need an emergency basically box and I need this to sort of burn, I need this to be a load, right? I need basically, I need some external circuit that can't act like a load if I need to get rid of power, right? So if you don't have a battery, then what you have is you have resistors. You basically have resistors, right? So what this resistors do is the following. 
right? Well, this resistors do as, so PM as a mechanical power, right? PM is a mechanical power, okay? So this right bolt, this is a fault, right? So this denotes, you know, the grid side has a fault, okay? So what do you do? Well, you, you have power coming out of the stator, right? You have power coming out of the stator. This power needs to go somewhere and it can't go to the grid because the grid is faulted. What do you do? As you add a switch like this, okay? So basically you had a switch. This switch, if it's closed, it's a bypass switch, a bypass this resistor. If it's open, right? If it's open, what does it do? Well, if it's open, it basically, Routes the power through this resistor. Okay, so that's what this switch does. Right? So, it's a, so if you detect the grid side has a fault, then you open the switch. Okay, then you open the switch, and the power goes through the, this resistor. And the idea is you, this is the way you burn power. Okay? So you can start to adjust your pitch. But you meanwhile, before you match the, the power, you know, the power the grid can take, uh, this resistor is where you burn this power. And the idea, this is called a stator dynamic resistance. So stator means it comes out after the stator. Right? So the turbine itself, or the generator itself doesn't change. But at the, after it, you connect this resistance. And the word dynamic, right? So this dynamic refer to this, these two elements. Okay? So it has a switch and the back-to-back -back SCR. Basically, we have a back-to-back -back SCR. Okay, so I have SCR and they're sitting there and it's called a stator dynamic resistance. Right? So it's, so the name uh, describes what the resistance does. And their job is to get rid of power. Okay, so this is obviously inefficient, but compared to, you know, damaging the blade or damaging the gearbox, you know, or having just the blades fly off the tower, this is preferable, right? So you bury some, you know, big resistor somewhere and you can route power through. Okay. So any question about this concept? I have a question. Um, sure. I'm not sure if you just mentioned it or I spaced out, but the little like hexagons in the middle with the two arrows, what are those? SCR, yeah. So we'll look at this more closely, but... Uh, oh, those are SCRs, okay. Yeah, those are SCRs. So this is a back-to-back -back SCR. And hexagon uh, is a sort of, if you don't have a lot of room, you draw a hexagon. Okay, got it, thank you. So these are back to back SCRs, yeah. So what they mean is they allow AC current to pass, but SCR controls how much AC current you're allowed to pass, right? So that's the idea with SCR. Okay, so any other questions about this idea? It's a very inefficient idea, but that this is actually, if you don't have this, the type one turbine can work. Right? So it's very hard to get type one turbines to work if you don't have this idea, if you don't have this kind of uh, circuit burning power. Right? So, and uh, you know, in the future, as more renewable come in, often you'll see the challenge. So when we think about electric, it's the grid. And often we think of the challenge is there's not enough power to meet demand. As you look at you know, more renewables and you look at sort of more detailed engineering problems, sometimes it's equally challenging or more challenging. We have more power than demand. Okay, so both are can be challenging. And for wind turbines are challenged normally uh, there's more power than demand. So you need to get rid of this power. Okay, so let's take a look at the equations and how we get rid of this power. So as we said, we have, all right, so let's draw this a little bit bigger. I have a switch. I have this sort of, uh, this symbol. So let me draw, let me draw let's, let's just, just draw this in a SCR version, okay? I have a CR this way, I have a SCR this way. And I have a resistance connection. Okay. 
So if this is open, right, if my switch is open, then for some parts, you go through the resistor, right? Some parts of the current, the AC cycle, it goes through that resistor. For some part of the AC cycle, you sort of, uh, you go through the SCR, okay? So we're gonna assume ideal SCR. Okay? So we're gonna assume ideal SCR is in here. So has anybody not seen what SCR is? Has anybody never heard of this? So I'm assuming we have all seen this SCR before. Right, so for people who take a 351, for sure you have seen this. For other folks, I'm assuming we have all seen how this thing operates. Right, so we can go through the equations again, but I'm gonna assume that you sort of have a good idea how, how these things work. Okay? So, right, so the question is, we want to understand is basically, we want to understand how much power is basically being burned off in this resistor. I want to know how much power is burned through here. So the way we're going to look at is I have some, right? So the power is three I squared, okay, RSTR, right? So we want to think of, right? so I have this resistor, this is our SDR. Okay. So this resistor has a value of RSDR. We want to understand how much power goes through this. And we want to understand as what is the current. Okay. So we want the current flow. Okay. So we want to understand what is the current flow going through this resistor. Right. So for this current flow, then let's take a look. Right. So this is my SDR here. So how does current flow? Well, right, so if I have a SCR, so let's say I have SCR and I try to pass current through it. So if this is my, So if I have a curve like this, what the SCR allows to go through is SCR will do something like this, right? Okay, so this is sort of the SCR behavior, right? So it doesn't turn on until a certain triggering angle, and then it sort of works until you, sorry, let's not draw this. So this is for a single SCR. Right, so SCR operates until you hit a triggering angle and it turns off once a current crosses zero. Again. Right, this is for SCR. Anybody remember what this angle is called? Anybody remember what this is called? Uh, firing angle? Uh, right? Close. Close, anybody else remember? Triggering angle, right? It's called a triggering angle. Anybody remember the symbol for this? Alpha, that's right. So this is a triggering angle. This is alpha, right? So this is the sort of the angle until the SCR becomes a wire, right? So I say open until you hit this angle, and then after that it's a wire. So if you put two SCRs back to back, what you get is you allow the full AC wave to go through. Right? You also allow this part to go through. Okay? Also allow this part to go through. Okay. So if you look at the current, so let's, let's say my current is I max sine omega t. Right, so I just say I have, have some, some sinusoidal current coming out of my stator, uh, coming out of my stator. Okay. Then if you look at the power I have, the power that gets dissipated in the resistor, the power that's dissipating the resistor is actually this power, okay, is actually this power. Okay. So, so, okay, so in the SCR actually I want to be a little bit uh, Careful here. So, 
we're going to assume that the SAR passes some part of this, and there's a triggering angle alpha, and there is sort of turn off angle beta. So we're going to assume that SAR only operates along this too, you know, for some pause when the current is going through and hitting a certain threshold of value. So this is my current, right? So I want to look at then the power dissipated through this LCR. Through, the power dissipates through this resistance, through this resistance. Okay. So as power is integral of I squared R, right? This is integral of I squared. Okay. So how do I do this integral? Where do I integrate from? So if the SCR is up, does the current go through the resistor? No, right? So the important thing to remember for this equation is if the SCR is on, it's as if the resistor is not there. Okay? So as, as if the resistor is not there. Okay? So this resistor, power only gets dissipated when this thing is off, right? So you integrate from zero to alpha, because at this point, my switch is open. My switch is open. My SCR is not on yet. So my current has to go through this resistor. So that's the power I dissipate through this resistor. Okay, so this is my power. All right, so I integrate from zero to alpha, d omega t. Similarly, I integrate from beta to pi, right? The sort of the tail end, I squared, R S D R, the omega t. Okay, so this is my integral, right? So to make this average power three over pi, again the three comes from the fact that uh, we're looking at three phase system. Okay, so three comes from th three phase. One over pi, we're looking over a cycle of pi. Right? We're looking over you know, the period is pi. We're looking over, and then we're going to do this compute. We're going we have the following integral. So you don't have to integrate this by hand, but this integral sort of should uh, make sense to us. Okay. Right. Any question about why this? Why we have this integral? Okay. So this is the integral we have, right? We have this integral. Then if you integrate this out, which is you don't have to do this, right? So you don't have to do this. So we'll do it. We have three. I a one squared. So this I a one squared, and this is the magnitude of the current, right? So let's say, so this is I a one. This is our magnitude of the current. R S D R over pi. That's just a constant we have. Inside we have pi minus gamma minus sine two alpha over two plus sine two beta over two. And gamma is beta minus alpha. It just uh, this how this integral works out. It just this is saying that you have a triggering angle on both sides, alpha and beta. And if you look at the power you dissipate, uh, this is the amount of power we get rid of. Yeah. Any questions here? The equation just come from. So a straightforward integration. Right. There's a straightforward integration. All right, so this is the equation we have. So this is the one way we can think of the this power equation. Right. So another way we can think of this power equation is to look at the following. Right. So you can look at power, you dissipate through this. You can looking at this, so you can separate out this into two parts. Three so I one squared multiply by R S D R over pi okay we can think of this in these two parts then we can think of this whole thing as some effective resistance okay R sub E Right, because if you look at the power dissipation equation, it's almost three i squared r. Okay, whereas r is given by this expression. Right? So based on how you set the triggering angles, 
you have larger or smaller effective resistance. Okay, right? You have smaller or larger effective resistance. So this is the way we, right? So, so we can define this RE to be the effective resistance. And this is sort of how much, this is the resistance that burns the power. Okay, this is the resistance that burns the power. And this RA1, a fault, is called IFSS. This, this comes from the, this is called the steady state fault current. Okay, right? So the thing to remember is I only have a factor resistance if there's a fault, right? I need to open my switch. If I open the switch, Effectively to the circuit, this looks like this whole thing looks like some RE, some resistors are with resistance RE. Okay, and uh, dissipates amount of power depending on what you know what current is established based on the fault condition. Any questions for this? Right, so the idea, so this equation you can look up, but the idea is, you know, I need to dump power and I need to dump power in a controlled way, right? You don't want to dump too much power, right? You want to, you know, you don't want to always be dumping power. So you can, you want to be able to change how much you dump power that's given by changing the triggering angle on the SCR. Okay, so if you change the triggering angle, you can change what RE is, a smaller RE will dissipate less power, a bigger RE will dissipate more power. Okay, All right. Questions? Okay, so then let's do one example. Let's do one example. So this example says I have a fault, right? So this fault is most faults, so the faults you worry about are the faults that reduce the grid voltage, right? That basically stops you from supplying power to the grid. Okay, so that, that sort of stops the power from going to the grid, All right? So if I have a fault that occurs and the fault lasts for 100 milliseconds and steady state as the voltage, the current, a pulse as a thousand amps, okay? steady state. Current value is a thousand amps. During the fault, uh, it basically says I need to get rid of 300 kilojoules of energy. Okay, so I need to, this is the energy I need to dump, basically, right? Dissipate. I want to compute the effective resistance. And this says, you know, if the effective resistance is Five oh, if the SDR resistance is five ohms, compute the triggering and the commutation angle. Okay. Compute these two angles. So commutation angle, this is beta, this is alpha. So, right, so the question says, what's RE? And if the SDR, uh, the actual resistance is five ohms, how do you realize this RE? All right, so let's, let's do this question. So if the energy is 300 kilojoules, what is the power I need to dissipate then? Right, so remember, what we had is this, uh, this equation is in terms of power, but this question, the problem is giving in terms of energy, joules, kilojoules. So how much power do I need to uh, dumping my resistors. How do I compute the power in this case? If I know the energy and I know the fault time, 
right? So chest has E over T, right? We said this is correct, right? So it's energy over time, right? So this is 300 kilojoule over 0.1, we get three megawatt, okay? So it's a sub sub substantial amount of power, but only over a short amount of time. And that's sort of normal in grid operations. And the grid, so normally the fall you see on the grid doesn't last very long. Okay, so it can be clear in a sort of fraction of a second. But in this fraction of a second, you have this much power. And uh, you, you, can't, you could be asked to dissipate a large amount of power. So this power I have, then the effect of resistance, right? So if you look at this equation, power is these three IA squared times RE. So RE is power three times my steady state for current. Okay, so this is three megawatt, three times one kiloamp squared, and turns out the effect of resistance is one ohm. Okay, I have a one ohm resistor. Okay, so these, these are big resistors. Okay, these are sort of large, large resistors just to radiate the heat away, but these are sort of the, the resistance is normally not very hot. Okay, so I have a large resistor, that's one ohm. Okay. And then our RE, right? So RE, what we have is five equals to RE equals to, not five. Right, so I have RE equals to RSDR multiplied by this whole equation. So multiply by pi one, one over pi, pi minus gamma, minus sine two alpha over two, plus sine two beta over two. Okay. So I have one equals to five over pi, So now we need to solve for alpha and beta. Okay, so gamma is beta minus alpha. So normally, as you have more sort of variables and equations, right? Because you can control both angles. Okay, you can control both angles. So you have two angles by one equation. So a standard way to do this is we just pick, okay, well, I need to pick an angle. So I can pick alpha to 30 degrees, right? And then I can solve, for example, you can solve by graphing, you can solve by you know, computer or, or by whatever, however you want to solve this kind of equations, okay? So you can either, plot and look at when you know when this equation is solved or just do a search or you know different other ways you can use your computer to solve these equations we got beta equals to 123 degrees so our uh, two angles are from beta one is 30 one 123 degrees so of course if you pick a different value for alpha you get a different value for beta but you know for this kind of question you can feel free to pick a value for alpha you can pick your own value for alpha. So as long as you get a value that works out, then that's fine. And since for us, you know, the midterm is take home and uh, open the computers. So you'll be given a question like this and you need to make sure that you can solve this kind of equations. Okay, it's a equation, a nonlinear equation, but in a single variable. So you can easily just plot this and read it off. But, uh, it is, it is expected that you know how to solve this kind of equation. Uh, so it's asking the chat, uh, in the real world, is a better optimization for alpha and beta? Not really, you need to pick one of them. You need just to pick some numbers. Uh, normally, you want the numbers to be reasonable, right? You don't want to pick alpha to be, let's say, 89 degrees or something like that. Right, so that's, that's, you may, there may not be a solution if you pick alpha like that. Or in general, we just pick them to be reasonable angles. Then it will work out. 
And in the real world, nobody uses type one anyways. But if you if you see a type one, then you can take angle Any questions? Any any more questions about this? Okay, so this is type one, right? So type one is basically a induction machine with a dynamic resistance in the stator side. Okay. So it's quite simple, uh, not very efficient, for example, in this case, you know, not, not terribly controllable, right? So remember this, right? so not very controllable, not very efficient, but uh, easy to design, okay? So I think it's a natural place. So let's take a break here. When we come back, we'll look at type two. Okay, we'll look at how does type two improve over type one. Okay. All right, so let's break. We'll come back at uh, 127 and uh, 127. All right, okay. So let's get started again and uh, let's look at type two. Okay, so type two, differs from type one uh, with a simple idea. Okay, so the idea is remember in type one, and I have resistance at the stator side. Okay, All right, so my resistance was after the stator. Okay. Type two, Let's basically put the resistance as a rotor. Okay, right. So basically people figure out, hey, in type one, we need dynamic resistance to make this whole thing sort of stable and robust. Then type two said, you know what? Right? If I'm gonna put in resistance, I may just well put them into the rotor side. Okay, and why not, you know, what's the point of putting them on the stator side? Why not just put them in the rotor side? Okay. So basically what this does is, this is your, where your resistance are. Okay, so you have three phase, A, B, and C, right? And for each of this phase, we're gonna attach a resistance to it. Okay. We're gonna simply add a resistance to it. And that resistance will be a controllable resistance. Okay, so we're going to add a controllable okay, we're going to add this controllable resistance. What adding this controllable resistance does uh, suddenly allows us to control a key parameter in our equivalent circuit model. Okay, right? So if you recall the equivalent circuit model, right? so if you recall what this model does is, so before going there, let's sort of take a little bit uh, deeper look into what this resistance does. Okay, So I still have this SDR. Right? So this is again, this is a back, back to back SCR. So this is two SCRs. So if the SCRs are on, right? So if you look at this, this side, and if you look at the resistance, as a function of time, right? We're gonna look into here when we'll look at the, we're gonna look at what the resistance is when we look at, look into this part. So that's time and this is the resistance we have. So if the SCRs are on, okay, so if I have something that's on, right? If this is a wire, then my resistance is effectively zero. Okay, right? So I have no resistance if the circuit can, if it can go through the wire. If this is an open, that means if the switches are off, I now have a, my, my resistance now is R. Okay, so T on, basically I have a wire, T off, I, have, I see this resistance R, right? 
Then the effect of resistance I see, right? Effect of resistance I see is the following. The effect of resistance I see are at is basically proportional to one minus K times R, where K is a duty cycle. So if the switch is always on, I see no resistance, right? If the switch is always off, I see this resistance R. So if I change the duty cycle, then whenever the switches are off, I, I see this resistance R. So effectively, I'm adding a resistance to the rotor side circuit. Okay. Effectively, I'm adding this resistance to the rotor side circuit. Right. Any questions? So this, okay, so this is my resistance, right? So if you have the rotor circuit, basically, what you have is if without this resistance, so what happens if you have no resistance? Well, we have R2, X2, just drawing the rotor side of this now. I have my R2S, one minus S resistance, right? This is without this added resistance. This was added. What happens? Well, all I do is this becomes R2 plus R at. Right, this becomes a, I'm adding resistance to my or to whatever roller resistance I had before. This is the same x2. And then here I have r2 prime plus r add prime s1 minus s. Okay, so basically what this allows me to do is I, I can now change the r2 parameter. So all this other reason does is give me a way to dynamically change how big this R2 parameter is. So I can change this R2 parameter. Because this R2 parameter shows up in all the equations we have, because this R2 parameter shows up so often in the equations, if I can dynamically change the R2 parameter, this gives me a way, right? this gives me a way, this gives me a way of changing the behavior of the turbine of the machine. Okay, so if you think about type one, type one is the machine is a machine, just that it has too much power can dump it. Type two is now I can go to the internal circuit of the machine, and adjust one of the parameters. Okay, in this case, I can adjust the parameter R2. The way I do it is I literally add a resistor, a controllable resistance to this. Okay, I literally add to it. Questions? Any questions about this? Okay, so it's important to understand so what's the difference between R1 and R2, between type one and type two, right? So type one is in the stator side, type two is in the rotor side. But the actual sort of the, the difference is now in type two, you're changing the circuit itself. You're changing the equivalent circuit of the machine itself. Whereas in type one, you're leaving the circuit unchanged. You're just adding external things to the circuit. Here, you're changing the R2 value, right? So basically, R2 shows up in the current equation, the power equation, the torque equation, all of these things. So you're basically dynamically changing all those parameters. Okay? So it's a, actually a conceptually a bigger difference than just say swapping state and loader. Okay, so there's a much bigger difference here. Right, so our equivalent circuit is again uh, simple, right? So this is our equivalent circuit. We have a, so this is some of the equivalent circuit. All again you do is you change the two parameters. You, where, wherever you see R2, R2 becomes R2 prime plus R at. Okay. That's it, right? So that, that's it in the, calculations, uh, there's nothing more than, right, there's, this is uh, all the 
this is sort of the only difference we'll see. Okay. The only difference is R2 goes to R2 plus Rs. So it turns out in this case, it's often easier to look at a simpler equivalent circuit. So here, this equivalent circuit uses a seminal equivalent. This uses seminal equivalent. And uh, sometimes computing seminal equivalent is a lot of work. So often what we want is we we'll often simplify the equivalent circuit. So we will simplify it to uh, the following. We'll still have a shunt. Right? So the seminal equivalent circuit includes a shunt. The shunt is just rolled into VTH and the value of RTH and XTH. Right? So here is we'll move the shunt in front. And then we'll move everything. Right? We're going to assume that what we have here is X2 prime, R2 prime plus R at prime. VD, right? So here, this is VD at, okay? So we'll make the modification. We'll ignore the stator side quantities. So here, ignore the stator side. Or you can think of as we're going to uh, include R1, X1 in R2 prime, X2 prime. Okay. So basically the way this circuit works is makes things a little bit simpler. Uh, you can think of, you know, we're gonna ignore the stator side R and X, or that we pull the shunt in front and, you know, add those values to R2 and X2. So either way they're equivalent. But the idea is, Often when we talk about type two, we want to avoid uh, this sort of seminal equivalent calculation. That turns out to be a lot of work. Okay, so to avoid that calculation, one, one thing we can do is we can use a simplified circuit by ignoring R1, X1. Okay, so this is sort of a simplified assumption we can make. Questions about this? Okay, so we're going to ignore this one. So we have this simplified circuit to work with, right? So now we can write all this equation. So the reason we use the simplified circuit is normally the grid voltage is given. Okay, the grid voltage is given and uh, we don't need to do any sort of seminal equivalent calculation for the grid voltage. So if the grid voltage is given, what we want to do is then we can compute IA2 prime in this case, this is a phaser, this is a complex phaser calculation. This is VD add minus VA1 X2 prime plus R add prime plus J X2 prime. Okay, so this is our I2 calculation. Now, of course, often when we use this kind of thing, what we want is we want to turn this thing around and look at the voltage So this voltage is minus i two prime multiplied by r two prime plus r s prime s one over s okay, so we often. So we have these two calculations. Then when you manipulate, so when you put two together and rearrange some terms, what we get is we get IA2 prime. This is equal to minus VA1. R2 prime plus R at prime S plus JX2 prime. Okay, so if you collect equations and uh, put everything together, you get this for the current. Okay, so again, by changing the value of R at, you can change the value of this current. Uh, if you change the value of a current, 
which can then value a power and so on. Okay, so this is the idea. So again, it's the same equation as before, except wherever you see R2, it's not R2 plus R at. Okay, so that operationally, that's where the only difference. Okay. And so we can keep going with this as we can now look at power, right? So for power, what we have is, minus three I two prime squared S one over S. So if you put everything together, this is power is equal to minus three, one minus S, S V A squared R two prime plus R add. S square plus X two prime square. Okay, so it's this sort of big thing, this big equation that gives us the power. Right, so and the power is given here also. Okay, and we give the power also here. Okay, so this is our power equation, it's our power equation. So if you look at this power equation, what we want then, so this equation is useful if you want to evaluate a bunch of things. Okay, so if you want to do computation, you can just plug in the value and uh, compute the power. Okay, so that, this is not much intuition here. But the, the interesting thing is we want to look at the impact of our add. Right, we want to look at if I have this adder resistance, what does it do? Okay, if I have this adder resistance, what does it do? Okay. So one way to look at it is let's look at this plot. Okay, let's look at this as power. Again, the power speed curve. Okay. So this is the synchronous, synchronous speed. So one, if I operate at synchronous speed, what I have is I have some curve that goes like this. Okay. And this is with R at equals to zero. Okay. So now if I increase the value of this resistance, what happened to this curve? Any guesses? Right, so this is my speed uh, power curve. If I increase this value of, so of, of course I cannot decrease the value of R, but if I increase the value of R2, let's say having a non-zero R add, what happens to this curve? Where, which way does the curve go? So if you're operating at the same slip, right? So if you're operating at the same slip and you, you and the way you increase the resistance, do you generate more or less power? Okay, so let's say my slip is constant, but now I increase my resistance. So R add is larger than zero. Do I generate less or more power? Right, so we look at this equation. Right, so it turns out if you look at this equation as a behavior as a following. So zero doesn't change, okay? So zero is still zero. What happens is if you increase R, the equation looks like this. Okay, so this is with R at greater than zero. Okay, so what happens is if you increase the amount of resistance I have, I can shift the curve. So it goes to the right and goes up. Okay. And uh, this is, you can see this by, you know, taking a value and plotting this curve. Okay. You can shift this curve to the right and up. What this allows me to do is, is give me a much wider operating region. 
Okay. Remember, it's much wider operating rate. Remember, we said, right? So if I want to operate at some speed, okay, remember, if I want to operate at this speed, this was not stable, right? For a type one turbo. This red point was not stable. However, if I can change the resistance, the added resistance, then suddenly this become a stable operating point for a different, for a sort of non-zero other resistance. And so what this allows you to do, and this sort of gives us a wider operating range. Okay, so the control is useful, right? Control is useful because allow a, because it allows us to do sort of dynamically when we're operating the turbine, but more control, give us a much wider speed we can operate at. Any questions about this? Okay, so this is the sort of the benefit, right, of a type two. As if we just modify the external circuit, then sort of the best we can do is doing a fault, we can down power. However, if you can directly mo modify the parameter of the equivalent circuit and uh, you turn all these equations, right, what allows you to do is suddenly allows you to, in operation to do sort of a much more, right, doing normal operation to do more things. For example, change where you operate on this curve, on this sort of C power curve. Right, you can turn a, you know, non, you can turn a unstable operating point to a stable operating point by changing your dynamic resistance, by changing sort of how much resistance you have. Okay. Right, so this is the point. Right, so this is again sort of a bigger plot, bigger plotting. So remember, k exists to one as r add, go to zero, k less than one, r add is greater than there. So here, this plot is showing the duty cycle. Right, so, offer, so how you actually change this is you have a duty cycle, right? Duty cycle is changed by the sort of electronics. So you go through electronics, you change your duty cycle, and then you can change what the value of what R add is. You can change what value you put to it. Okay, right, and what you see is you see this sort of this pull out power, right? This pull out power is a maximum power. This power shifts. Uh, if you have different values of R at, right? This, this sort of power shifts, right? So we have this power shifting and I have different value of R at. So let's do some calculation. Let's do this sort of a calculation to see what the value should be. So if we look at the power power, which is the maximum power I have, PD equals to minus three, one minus S over S one squared, R2 prime, R add prime, S squared, X2 prime squared. So my maximum power is basically, I take a derivative, right? I can take this derivative and set it to zero. Okay. You can set this to zero and we'll turn out if you solve for this equation, what you get is the following. We need to define a parameter called M. Another parameter. So this is the maximum slip. This is a slip that produces the maximum power. So this is the Slip that gives max power. And then what we have is we simply plug in the slip into our power into our power equation to get the maximum power. So the power power, the maximum power I can generate is to operate as this slip as prime given by the above equation. 
this is our this this is basically our equation, right? So you take the derivative set to zero, and it just turns out this is what the maximizing slip is. This is slip that maximizing the power. Okay, so it's important to remember this equation, right? So this is sort of a typed out version of this equation. But uh, it's just important to remember what this equation is. Remember how to find this equation. Okay. Remember, you know, uh, yeah. So the S prime is a little bit complicated to find, right? But this is just the way it turns out for this equation. Okay. All right, so if you look at this equation, right? If you look at this equation, and then you look at this curve. Okay. Let's say you look at this equation and look at this curve. So now you have choices, right? Now you have choices on those curves. So if this is your slip, okay, let's say your, your turbine having to be operating at this, right? Let's say your turbine happens to be, right, okay. Right, so, right, so what I want to say, I want to say, right. So the, you, it's important for this R at to be dynamic, to be so such that you can change this over time, as if your turbine is operating at this speed, then obviously when you increase R at, you become less efficient because part of that power becomes loss, right? So if you have larger added resistance, you have more loss in the system. So it's important to change this dynamically, right? You don't want to be unnecessarily large. Okay, so if you can get away with zero R add, you do zero R add, right? So you only turn, you only make it now zero if you want to follow the curve, if you want to follow the curve to the right. Okay. So sometimes you have a question of, you know, why don't we just, if we care about the operating region, if we care about, you know, being stable, why not just make R add a big number? The reason is if you make a big number, then you basically is losing power, you're losing efficiency. Okay, so the idea is you want to operate with as small as the other resistance as possible while maintaining stability, right? While, while being in the right region of the curve. Any questions about this? Okay, so no questions, let's do an example again. Example problems. Okay. So here I have a type two wind turbine, six poles, uh, 690 volts. And these are the parameters for the machines. Okay. I want to compute the power power, basically what is the maximum power. And then I want to repeat the calculation if I insert a resistance with a duty cycle of 50%. Right. So that's just, just showing that we can get a larger power. We can get a larger pull out power. All right, and the, so the way to do the calculation, this is uh, really simple. Okay, this is quite simple. Right? We just repeat the calculation several times. So if I, here is no adder resistance. Or add a zero. So let's say I don't add any resistance. Then what I have is I can still compute this F, right? This equation works for when the added resistance is zero. Okay, so if our added prime has a value of zero, that's fine. You can still use this equation. Okay, so we're going to use the same equation, plugging our added zero. So I have M equals to R2 prime x2 prime 0.1. The maximizing slip s prime is minus m, m plus m squared plus one, minus 0 0.1105. That's my maximizing slip, right? And then the power drawn is, My power drawn as you plug in into this equations, minus three, one minus S, S prime, one squared, or two squared, R two prime S 
squared plus x2 prime squared. Do all those things, putting everything into this, we got 2.53 megawatt. Right, we get 2.53 megawatt if there's no added resistance. So we can compute this with added. Okay, we can compute if I add a resistance to this, what is the value of the maximum speed? So here the amount of added resistance, this is the actual physical resistance I add times one minus the duty cycle. So the physical resistance add is 0.02 times one point. Duty cycle is 50%. So I add a resistance of 0.01 ohms. Now the exact same equation as before, right? exact same equation, R2 prime, R add over X2 prime, this is 0.2. The maximizing slip is minus M. M plus minus 244. And we have here the pull up power as this is 2.904 megawatt. Okay. So if we compare from before, we have a larger pull up power, right? So before we have something like 2.5, here our pull up power is 2.9. A larger power. Also, it'd be interesting to compare the speed. And so, if you compare the speed of the machine, if this is zero, then the maximizing slip, this is minus zero one five. So, the speed. For this road, for this machine, this is actually RPM. Okay, this is our speed. If this is not 0.01, right here we have 0.01, slip is much larger, minus 0244, and then the speed is also much larger. And we just have end up having a much, much 0.8 RPM. So we have a larger speed, right? So the idea is, right? So I do get a little bit more power, but I get a lot of wider operating range. Okay, so if my slip, as I said, you know, if my speed is more than uh, 1332 RPM, then I need this R app, right? I need some added resistance to open up my operating region. Okay? I need to, I need to add resistance to make my operating range wider. Any questions about this? Okay, all right. So now let's look at something that's maybe a little bit less obvious. So let's look at the torque to speed relationships. Then. Okay. So before we look at power to speed, so now let's look at developed torque to speed. Okay. Let's look at this. So of course I have, you know, this asynchronous frequency, this is zero. Okay. So let's say this is our add equals to zero. Now add a, if I add some resistance, do I get more maximum torque? All right, so in power, we saw sort of this curve moves to the right and up. For this torque curve, does it also move up? Can I change the maximum torque I have in my system? by adding resistance? Do you think it should be possible to change this maximum torque? Can I get more torque? Physically, right? Physically, without doing the sort of calculations. Physically, can I get more? Is it possible? 
right? So the right, so the obvious thing is no, you cannot get more torque. Torque is controlled by the mechanical power as delivered to your rotor, right? That, that's a torque. You're not going to get more tor maximum torque by adding resistance. Okay, torque is controlled by wind. You're not getting more of it. And so what this happens is if you add resistance, this thing shifts basically to the right, but it doesn't go up. It doesn't go up. Right? So this is okay, right. So that because torque is controlled by wind, right? So torque is a is this thing that developed by the spinning of your blades going through the gearbox. You can't get that by adding resistors. Resistors are elect electrical devices, right? The electrical devices. That has nothing to do with the mechanical torque into your turbine. Okay? So the maximum, it changes where the maximum occurs, but cannot increase the maximum. Okay? So torque, if you look at this, is the maximum torque cannot, is not uh, impacted. Okay. The maximum torque is not impacted. It just where the maximum torque occurs as impacted, you can still change the operating range, but you cannot, right, there's sort of no way to, uh, there's no way to change the maximum amount of torque you have. Okay. You cannot change the amount. You can change where this occurs. Okay, so if you look at the maximum torque equation, so we won't go through this again. We won't go through this again. But this is a torque equation. And if you differentiate and uh, you calculate what the maximum torque is, it turns out this number does not depend on R2 or Okay, it just doesn't depend on. It just has no dependence on this resistance, right? So you're not going to get more resistance. You're not getting more torque by playing around with the other resistance. Okay, right? so that, that's not the that's sort of the conservation of energy on on that side. However, you can get more power out of it, right? You can be more efficient in converting this torque to power by adding this other resistance. Okay, so this this is what you can do. Right, you can have the same amount of torque. So remember, power is torque times speed. Right, so if you have the same amount of maximum torque, but you can operate, but this torque happens at a larger speed, you can get more power out of it. Okay, so that's fine. You can get more power out of it, but the torque will not change. Because the max torque doesn't change. But what the added resistance allows you to do is to basically, well, at the same torque, Go faster, right? operate at a faster speed, hence more power. Okay, so that's that's what the other resistance allows us to do. Okay. Any question about this? Uh, this? We won't do this calculation. Any question about torque versus speed? Okay, so there's something to remember, right? The so max torque doesn't change, but the max speed, right? The speed at which the maximum torque occurs changes. And power is again speed multiplied by torque, so the power changes. Okay, power changes. Right. Okay, so this is the idea for adding resistance in the rotor side. Okay. And so now let's do some examples to see sort of how this thing. Actually, so let's do an example to look at torque and power, and then we'll do, we'll do several examples. And uh, for we'll finish up this class, actually. So again, to make sure we understand all these equations correctly, right? So for this part of the course, there's a lot of equations, and really the key for the let's say the midterm or the homework is to know where to find these equations. Right? You don't need to remember any of them, right? You, these uh, this open book. So, but the key is to know which one of these two use. And where to find them, right? So that, that's the key. So let's do, start, do some examples for this case. Okay, let's see how we use them. Okay. Right, so one is this sort of trick question you may see is same machines from before, right? We want to compute the maximum torque and the speed 
at the maximum torque with and without any resistance. Right, so same, same equation, same thing as before. Right, so let's do this. So let's say R add, this is zero. So I have no added resistance. Again, the max torque equation comes out here. Okay, so you can read off use these equations. Right? So you can just plug numbers into these equations. So the maximizing slip is minus R2 prime, X2 prime, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, equal to minus 0 0.1 here, minus, okay. And so the speed, if you plug this into the speed equation, this is S, this is the synchronous speed, one minus S, so this gives us a two RPM. And the maximum torque, this is three over two, right? It's just this one equation we plug into to find the maximum torque. V1 squared, x2 prime, omega s. This is 18.94 18 kilonewtons meter. A answer was R added. And then here, if we add this resistance, we get a star. This is minus R2 prime plus R added prime over X2 prime. This is 0 0.01, 0 0.2. And you get a synchronous speed. This is an S, one minus S again. This is RPM, okay? And it's the same right, the same torque from before. Okay. So this is a trick question, is because you know it's sort of on the midterm, you may see this question. And then what people do is they start to panic because they compute the same maximum torque. And then sort of sometimes people think, oh, they must be different because I added this. Right, I have R add. Why is it? Why is the number the same? Then you know sometimes students start to invent uh, equations and you know somehow trying to get different solutions and the maximum torque and things like that. So that's where you often make mistakes. Right. So the key thing to remember is the maximizing speed changes, but the value of the maximum torque itself doesn't change. Okay? You can have added resistance. That's not going to change this TD star number. Okay? So the same number. Right, so that's sort of one thing to watch out for in your uh, midterm. Any questions about this? This address. Okay, so if not, let's end the class here today. Next class, we'll finish up type two. We'll look at sort of other benefit type two has in in addition to the operating region. Then after we finish type two, we'll take a detour, we'll do power electronics. Okay, we'll do power electronics, then we'll do type three. The reason we'll do a review of power electronics before doing type three is, if you look at type one and type two, you achieved control by adding resistors. Anytime you're adding resistors, you're losing efficiency. Right, that's just the way resistors work. Anytime you pass current through a resistor, you lose efficiency. Okay, so type three is really a way to say, I still want control, but I don't want resistors. I want electronic control. Okay, so, but before we can go to type three, we need to do a refresher on power electronics. It's like looking at you know a bunch of reminding us for simple converter circuits like, like that. Okay, but we'll finish here today. Next class, we'll finish type two, power electronics, and type three. All right, okay, so uh, no questions, then thanks guys, see you on Thursday. Thank you.